Welcome to Development Talks at South South News. I'm Bill Miller. What is the United Nations Global Compact? What is the compact doing to bring together over 8,000 businesses around the world to focus attention on issues such as sustainable development and anti-corruption activities? My guest today is going to bring us up to date on this very interesting group within the United Nations system. My guest today is Mr. George Kell. Mr. George Kell, a German national, is the executive director of the UN Global Compact. In 1997, Mr. Kell became a senior officer in the executive office of the UN Secretary, Secretary General Kofi Annan. Mr. George Kell, welcome to South South News and Development Talks. Great to be here, Bill. I appreciate you being with me today. Let's jump right into it, George. What is the UN Global Compact? When was it formed? Why was it formed? And basically, what do you do? The Global Compact was launched by former Secretary General Kofi Annan in the year 2000. The mission has been and still is to make sure that business supports development, that business respects universal principles in the area of human rights, decent workplace conditions, environmental stewardship, and good governance anti-corruption. So it's based on 10 principles, 10 commandments. The 10 commandments, we expect chief executive officers to take a stand on these principles, and then every year to disclose progress made. In addition, the United Nations the Global Compact offers what we call opportunities to be part of the solution, to collaborate on key issues, uh, or whether it's women empowerment, climate issues, water management, and so forth. Mm -hmm. The Global Compact is rapidly growing. For 15 years, we have seen enormous growth. It's active now in nearly 100 countries, uh, often organized at country level. Uh, we sustain it globally by offering issue platforms uh, with special uh, edges. Uh, it's rapidly expanding. It shows that business increasingly has a stake in public policy issues. Exactly. And if someone were watching this show, uh, someone who has a business, be it a small business, 150 employees or 150,000, whatever it might be, can they become a member of the Global Compact? And if so, how do they do that? Yes, it's free as such, uh, because the United Nations uh, wants to improve the public goods. Uh, on our website, unglobalcompact.org, how to join. It's a serious business. We always advise CEOs, chief executive officers, think twice before you put in a letter to the Secretary General where you commit yourself and your company to implement the principles and to take action in support of UN goals because you're expected every year to make a public report on what progress you're making. If participants fail to make a public annual progress report, then unfortunately we have to delist them. And already we delisted over 4,000 corporates from all over the world. The good news is there's still more coming in than going out. So overall the Global Compact keeps on growing and we stand today at over 8,000 active corporations from all sectors, all sizes. We welcome all sizes. What matters is the intention, the good intention to implement the principles and to get serious within your own corporation. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And this sounds like a win-win situation. It's prestigious to be involved with the well, United Nations and you can be a good yeah. corporate socially responsible right. entity. But it's serious business exactly. because uh, to stay with the, the Global Compact, to be ethical and to practice what you say you want to do requires serious efforts. So we do expect companies to align their internal processes, their compliance systems, their policy directions with the Global Compact and we expect them to actually take action, to engage and not all are living up to that expectations, but the good news is a growing number is because there's a business case, because more and more companies discover that actually it pays off to be ethical, it pays off to be environmentally smart, it pays off to be efficient, it pays off to also empower women at the workplace, and it pays off to pay less bribery. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that affects the bottom line. And our viewers can go to www.unglobalcompact.org and get more information on the Global Compact. You mentioned about companies. Do you find that companies are becoming more interested in participating in activities to combat climate change, to focus on human rights, to work on anti-corruption activities that say maybe when you started 
10, 15 years ago? Absolutely. 15 years ago, it was primarily a moral argument. You know, doing the right thing is the right thing. So be morally correct. Today, increasingly, it's still a moral imperative, very important, because the ethics matter. But increasingly, what, also, what is also coming in now is what economists call the material argument, meaning businesses recognize it makes good business sense. Uh, at least if you think a bit long term, it makes sense to be efficient, it makes sense to be inclusive, it makes sense to empower your people, it makes sense to aspire to the highest level of efficiency. And this change is happening only now, because only now investors, big investors, are paying attention to these issues. The reason is really that transparency is now everywhere. You can no longer hide. You pay a high cost if you hide, and then you are discovered. It's much smarter to be proactive. The reason is also that resource scarcity, water is becoming more precious. Also, there's talk about carbon pricing. It's coming one way or the other. So it makes sense to be ahead of the curve. So financially, increasingly, it makes sense to practice corporate sustainability. And that is generally new, and that is transforming markets from within. The good news is more and more CEOs and companies realize this, but the bad news is too many companies are still sitting on a fence. Actually, the great majority is still in an old mindset. They argue these are not our issues, it's the job of governments, my job is to make a financial profit, end of the story. But more and more realize that to make a financial profit, you also need to pay attention to social issues. You also need to pay attention to environmental issues and to governance issues. And that is, I think, good news for the United Nations. You mentioned the environmental issues. A lot of people are becoming more and more convinced that the number one problem we have is climate change. It's going to affect economies all around the world, businesses, as you mentioned. It's going to affect our standard of living, our quality of life. What I know every time I, it seems like I turn on the computer, I see you're involved or your group's involved in a lot of really interesting activities. What have you done in this area? Were you involved in the previous UN conferences on sustainable development in 2012 Rio Plus 20 or the Lima conference? Are you getting ready for Paris at the end of this year? What, what are you doing in that area? It's a top priority on our agenda, really top, top. Uh, another one is in the social domain is on good governance, which is equally important. But climate change really is humanity's biggest challenge. It's everybody's problem. And the nation state system, governments alone just can't do it. So the good news is on the business side, when in Copenhagen in 2009, the famous World Conference, business started to prepare. A small number of companies were ready to advocate for low carbon solutions, a small number. The big majority was still sitting on a fence. Today, more and more companies are actually making the business case for pricing carbon because they see that the opportunities on low carbon solutions, whether it's renewable, solar, or superior process technologies or transportation, is gaining market shares rapidly. So the opportunity space for climate solutions is growing fast. So more and more companies are flipping now, and they're actually arguing, well, let's grow this space even faster because this is the future. So we see right now a small revolution in the making, and we are mobilizing for Paris big time, trying to get as many CEOs behind this agenda as possible. It's, of course, true that many existing companies still defend old turfs, yeah? and carbon-intensive industries are still very, very powerful. But those which thrive on green and clean technology and processes are increasingly gaining the upper hand. So the pendulum is changing, the landscape is changing. And that is good news, and our rallying cry is carbon pricing. Because carbon, when you emit it, is an externality. Those who emit don't pay a price for it. The price is being paid by society, global warming. Now, if you are a free marketeer and you believe in free markets, you want to make sure markets are really free. So carbon must be priced. It perverts markets because it holds back green investment. It is actually discouraging. So our big rallying cry for Paris is mobilizing leading CEOs worldwide 
to argue it's time to put the price on carbon. Mm -hmm. And speaking of price, it's been estimated that something well, in the United States, just the fossil fuel companies get like four billion plus dollars in subsidies every year, but worldwide, I think it's like 500 billion, yes. something like that, and that figure may be off a little. But are the companies coming to the conclusion that perhaps if some of those subsidies went to clean solar or inner, uh, wind or something like that, that they could even become more competitive even more quickly? Very true, and some good developments happened just recently because the oil price dropped so much. Mm -hmm. So some major emerging markets used the opportunity to do away with fuel subsidies. We call them perverse subsidies because they really do a lot of damage and they are very hard to get rid of once you have subsidies because many poor people depend on it, but there are smart policies to provide direct assistance to poor instead of just subsidizing often dirty diesel fuel. So we got rid of Indonesia, India is thinking about it, and a few other major markets are right now phasing out perverse subsidies, but they still exist, even the European Union which often claims to be on the forefront of climate issues, there are still $50 billion of perverse fuel subsidies in the European Union under the headline agriculture or some other you know, lobbying interest that maintain the privilege there. That is a low-hanging fruit, getting rid of that. In addition, markets must be built for carbon. The World Bank has embraced a huge project. Now we work closely with them. The IMF is actually preparing something on pricing also carbon and issuing a book on how to do effective carbon pricing. Carbon pricing also can be a major source of revenue for development issues because those who consume the most presumably also pay more. So it's a wonderful way also to see it as a potential source of finance. Now we of course do not advocate taxes as such but it has been proven by all economists, uh, former advisor of George W. Bush eloquently writes about it, uh, current uh, leading economists write eloquently about it, that it's the most reasonable thing is to price carbon. And it can be done tax neutral, so it doesn't have to lead to increased tax, but it taxes what is bad. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And it seems only fair that we pay our way as we go. Somebody's paying for it. Either the taxpayer is paying for it through dirty air or increased hospital expenses or medical problems or whatever, but the people who are producing it should be the ones paying right. for it, which is only... That's what Rio, that. Rio 92 established, that principle, yeah? Uh, exactly, yeah. that's quite right. Speaking of Rio 92, that, uh, 1992, the Earth Summit, right. the, uh, which was really a, sort of the major kickoff to this whole discussion of sustainable development, what have you, the... There really, there have been several important conferences along the way since 1992, but the big one, the make or break conference in the eyes of a lot of people is the one coming up in Paris in December. How important is it to get a, a grand bargain at that and to really get the countries firmly committed to reaching certain goals within a specific time frame? Right now, governments are very cautious. Uh, they promote what they call a bottom-up process. So they, every government is encouraged to come with specific goals uh, and then every country it's left up to every country how to implement those goals. Yeah? That has advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is that everybody can move at his or her own speed so the common denominator does not hold back anybody. The disadvantage obviously is there's no higher bar that kind of induces more rapid change. I think it is of fundamental importance, Paris. I think it's also a test for multilateralism. It will test heads of states and governments whether they are capable of thinking long term, whether they are able to go beyond the election cycle and think also beyond their own immediate uh, election benefits. It's about humanity and it's about true leadership. And it's also about multilateralism. Is the world, the nation state system still capable of articulating global frameworks that have meaning, that lead to real change. I think it's really, really important. Mm -hmm. And what role will the Global Compact play? Will you have a side conference going on or will you have your members involved in the Paris discussions? Yes. What role will you play? We have been asked by the French government to be the official convener of private sector interfaces. So there are many, many global activities preparing for that now. 
from the World Economic Forum, Global Compact, uh, many others. And we will bring this all together under one framework, uh, under caring for climate, that's how we call it. Uh, and under caring for climate, we will try to get the best voices out of business to encourage policymakers to be bold and ambitious. So we want obviously the carbon leaders, the CEOs who actually internally within their own corporation uh, practice what they preach, who have a high price on carbon within their company, so their own investment decisions are directed towards cleaner and uh, low carbon uh, processes. And companies who actually also lobby what they preach, because many companies still say we are green, at the same time they outsource lobbying to other trade associations who then have a capture on domestic politics and tell policymakers not to introduce climate policies. So we are shining some light on corporate lobbying as well. We think it's time to show your colors. The time is over for gambling. The time is over for a double game. It's really time to embrace transformative change. And one change forward is put a price on carbon that is high enough to materially impact any future investment decisions. And of course, our viewers can go to unglobalcompact.org and get much more information about what we're talking about and your role in Paris at the end of the year. Before the program, we were talking about a major conference you have coming up, it would be the latter part of June yeah. in New York. What exactly is that and well, what, what is your goal? It's a small celebration because we are 15 years young. So former Secretary Jean Kofi Annan, current Secretary Ban Ki-moon, uh, leading CEOs, our board uh, and our issue platforms will gather to take stock of where we are and will try to chart the future uh, pathways of catalytic change. And it will also be the time when I will step down and pass over the key to my successor because after 16 years, day and night, <laughs> uh, it's time to see a dentist. <laughs> Take a break. <laughs> right. But it's very exciting because uh, the Global Compact is the UN's first public-private network-based organization. So it's entirely voluntary. We have no enforcement, as you know. You know, we have no financial means. We have only the power of ideas. And the idea is very simple, ethical, sustainable business pays. It's better to join and to do so in a transparent and accountable way. Exactly. That's it. And when you talk about ethics, it brings to mind corruption yes. and anti-corruption activities. And that has to be one of the, yes. one of the most challenging areas that you're, or issues you're dealing with because yes. you hear businesses say, well, to operate in country X, yeah. I have to bribe these yeah. officials or I have to pay off so many people. How do you get the people on board to yeah. have a united front, a united voice to say that really corruption affects all of us adversely and we need to work against yeah. it? I actually, I mentioned we have two overarching priorities, maybe three, but climate is certainly one. The other one is what you could call improving governance, the enabling environment. Yeah? And there corruption really is the number one ticket issue. Yeah? And we have worked on this now for over 10 years. Uh, finally, finally, there's a critical mass of companies who are willing to also stand up on this issue. Because in the past, even companies which tried to be as ethical as possible, they didn't want to put their neck out because they feared if they put their neck out, it gets chopped off, you know, because <laughs> they step on somebody's toes. Finally, we have a critical mass big enough to take a public stand at country level and globally. And there's a huge movement now going on. We call it the call to action on anti-corruption. There are 300 CEOs behind it from many countries. And we will soon play in key markets, in key countries, the argument that, look, if you collaborate improving corruption, everybody benefits greatly. And let's start with simple things like public procurement, all public procurement should be public. If all public procurement were truly public, we would get rid of a major source of corruption. It's in the public procurement domain where most of the corruption occurs on a big picture scale. So we are launching a big campaign combined with country level, what we call collective action initiatives. We have them up and running in a number of countries where 
companies, both local and foreign, work together with public officials of government departments to improve procurement, to improve the enabling environment, to explore how to get rid of petty bribery, how to enforce uh, an end of extortion, because there are also horrible things going on in that domain. So it's a major effort. Will it make a big difference? I hope it will, because at the end of the day, corruption is the abuse of power for personal gains. And it's linked to what you could call governance failures. And if you look around the world, the many countries where there is now violence and civil war, you know, this is where governance is totally failing. In such environments where there is conflict or high level of violence, you know, corruption is of course systemic, but in addition, you have the total breakdown of existing institutions. So I hope that the Global Sustainable Development Goals with their new goal 16 will give a big push in improving governance, in particular the enabling environment for business to grow so that sustainable, clean, ethical business actually pays off and that it is being rewarded. And that is, of course, a long-term goal and it's tied with politics, with power, but uh, it's too important not to tackle it. I'm glad you mentioned the Sustainable Development Goals because they will be the successor of the Millennium Development Goals to eradicate or to reduce abject poverty by 50%, to have universal primary school education, to empower women. Do you factor those 17, the new 17 goals, into your activities? Do you bring those to the attention of the businesses that are involved? Yes, very much so. Uh, in September, there will be a big heads of state meeting here in New York. Uh, we will organize a private sector forum in parallel and we will show to governments how business plays an important role in the implementation of the SDGs. For example, some of the SDGs we have already issued platforms which match perfectly. Women empowerment, uh, water stewardship, climate, uh, goal 16 we just talked about and so forth. So the global development goals, the SDGs, we very much hope and believe will accelerate the collaboration on the side of business to rally around specific goals. And we have been advertising this throughout the world. And the feedback is actually good because business, of course, chooses and picks which of the SDGs are relevant. They do not sign on to all 17 goals, uh, but they choose strategically. And then the added value really is that it unleashes collaboration because the future in corporate sustainability is actually collaboration. In the past, companies embraced the compact and continue doing so to be themselves better than their comp competition. But if you work in a country where the government is failing, for example, you alone cannot change the enabling environment. But you stand the chance of doing so if you collaborate with your peers and even competitors and your suppliers. So collaboration around specific SDGs is a very promising pathway to bring about massive change to align business solutions with public policy priorities. Mm -hmm. And of course we can't go through all 17 SDGs today's sustainable development goals but our viewers can go to your website go to un.org or just Google sustainable development goals to look at all 17 of them. They're all very important. One that seems to have accelerated, it's accelerated I think over the years has been to empower women. How important is that to make women a critical player, be it in the private sector, be it in the public sector, wherever it might be, as head of the, or part of the, one of the heads of family? How important is that? Uh, it's our biggest issue platforms. We call them, we have seven global issue platforms. Women empowerment is biggest in terms of number of companies and nearly 1,000 companies behind that platform. Caring for Climate is the second biggest. Mm -hmm. uh, women empowerment, the business case is very, very strong, both at the macroeconomic level. Japan, for example, just switched on to women empowerment. Why? Because of demographic changes, aging. So how do you revive economic growth if half of your population you know, is underutilized? It's stupid. <laughs> so that's the macroeconomic case. Uh, at the corporate level, uh, it's well known that you know woman efficiency is equal, if not better, to male. Yeah? And, uh, with all due respect to ourselves here, but also all service everywhere, women are, are 
as cutting edge, if not more, than men are. So not to encourage woman engagement means you would miss out on a huge pool of creativity. So more and more CEOs realize this, uh, and there's a big movement going on. Uh, it varies country to country. It's at different stages, but it's a very, very important issue. And especially, you know, in the demo with the demographic changes around the world, it gains added uh, relevance. Exactly. Well, George, the last question, easiest, I think. <laughs> as you view the Global Compact, what do you see as the major challenge as it moves into the, into the future? Governance failure worldwide. I'm really concerned that uh, we are living right now in an era of government governance failure. Uh, governments were set up under the nation state systems, you know, to administer power within one certain country. Today, the world is very interconnected and interdependent. And we have nothing really in place to effectively support interdependence to kind of fight the bad things and promote the good things as governments do at national level. And I'm really concerned that the international community has not been fast enough to adopt to global interdependence. This is why I believe transnational networks, such as the Global Compact, can at least be a bridge you know, to soften some of the negative and enhance some of the positive. But much more needs to be done in this space. We still pretend to live in the 18th century you know, with the nation state systems and here's our border lines, you know, this is our country and these are the others. In reality, we totally depend on each other. We talked about climate change. The air doesn't respect national sovereignty, diseases, uh, and so forth. So we, we really need to revisit how to better support positive forces in global interdependence. And I'm concerned that politicians today are too much preoccupied with their domestic internal thinking, and they're too short-term too, to have a long-term vision on how to better provide stewardship for global challenges. I hope there will be an awakening soon. Well, George Kell, Executive Director of the United Nations Global Compact, I want to thank you so very much for a very interesting and a very informative program. What a pleasure. Thank you. Here. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us on South South News and Development Talks.